I'm Charlotte Perrell, your host of Leia's Code to Be Honest, or Everyday Law, where we discuss the laws that affect you every day. Lawyers are the primary contact that the public has with the legal system. But how are lawyers regulated? How are they licensed? And what happens if a lawyer makes a mistake or a lawyer does something that's incorrect? Today, we're going to go behind the scenes to understand how lawyers are regulated and how they're licensed. Please join us for this and much more on Laius Cote de Honest. Today we have with us Paula Frederick. Paula Frederick is the General Counsel for the State Bar of Georgia. She is an attorney who has been practicing in Georgia for a number of years, uh, is a graduate from Duke University and Vanderbilt Law School, initially started her career with the Legal Aid Group and then has been General Counsel with the State Bar of Georgia and in the Counsel's Office for over 25 years. Thank you very much for joining us today. My pleasure. All right. Many folks understand that the bar is the group that regulates lawyers, but they don't really understand what its full function is, how it is that lawyers get licensed and so forth. Can you give us just kind of a general overview of what the state bar is and what its functions are and how they regulate lawyers uh, that practice in the community? Sure. And before I go into how we do it in Georgia, I want to make it clear that different states do it differently. Okay. So um, the way that we do it in Georgia is that we are regulated really by the Supreme Court of Georgia. And the Supreme Court established the State Bar of Georgia as an organization to regulate lawyers. So we are a mandatory bar state. If you want to practice law here on more than a temporary basis, you have to be a member of the State Bar of Georgia. Um, right now we've got about 45,000 members of the State Bar of Georgia. Okay. So we do everything from enforce the rules of professional conduct that we'll talk about I guess in more detail a little bit later mm -hmm. to um, making sure that lawyers remain competent by requiring them to take legal education classes every year. Um, we do some lobbying to sort of protect the public by ensuring that only lawyers are practicing law and non-lawyers aren't. Um, but, but the primary function of the, the State Bar of Georgia is regulating the practice of law. And we do that through a lawyer discipline system. Okay. So there are 10 lawyers in the general counsel's office at the bar, and we receive grievances from members of the public who have a problem with a lawyer. We investigate those cases, and ultimately, if it looks like the lawyer has done something that's unethical, something mm -hmm. that violates our rules of professional conduct, then we prosecute the lawyer and try to have him or her either reprimanded or suspended from practice or disbarred, which is the ultimate sanction, which means that they can't practice law anymore. All right. Let's back up a little bit um, before hopefully they get into trouble. <laughs> uh, you know, what is it that lawyers are required? Uh, what are the various requirements for lawyers to even be licensed in the state? Obviously, they're going to need to have the requisite legal education and so forth, but just graduating from law school isn't going to be enough. What are the requirements that the bar has, ethical requirements and so forth, with regard to lawyers? Georgia requires that you graduate from a, a law school that's accredited by the American Bar Association. The ABA has a whole section of, for legal education that um, investigates schools to make sure that they are providing um, potential lawyers with the right kind of an education. So um, first of all, the school has to be certified by the American Bar Association as providing a valuable um, legal education. And once you've graduated from law school, you have to sit for the bar exam. People right. know about the bar. But you can't even sit for the bar, even with a law degree in Georgia, until we have found that you are morally fit to be a lawyer. And uh, so there is this fitness certification process that every potential lawyer has to go through after they've graduated from law school, where we're looking at things like um, whether the potential lawyer has a criminal background. Okay. And not 
every kind of, of criminal background is going to disqualify you from being a lawyer. If you've had, um, you know, some problems with the law as a teenager, a, a shoplifting conviction, or even an isolated DUI or something like that, it's likely you would still be allowed to sit for the bar and be found morally fit. But if you have, um, say, felonies in your background or have stolen money, because lawyers hold other people's money, um, it might be that you would not even be allowed to sit for the bar, even after graduating from law school. Okay. Um, is it possible that someone may not recognize or realize that that's the case, go to law school and then find out that they don't actually qualify or that they are denied the ability to actually sit for the bar even after they've gone through the law school Un process? Unfortunately, that does happen. Yeah. Um, and people will uh, go to law school with the hope that by the time they're out, they can prove that they've overcome whatever the problem is in their past and, and that they're worthy of the trust that a lawyer um, gets. So there's the whole fitness and character process. And then after the applicant has passed the bar, they have to um, swear to uphold the rules of professional conduct, which are the ethics rules that all lawyers agree to be bound by. Mm -hmm. And um, they have to pay the bar uh, a license fee that they pay every single year. They have to agree to get their continuing legal education credits every year. You have to take 12 hours so that you keep current with changes in the law. Right. And then you can become licensed. But okay. those are ongoing responsibilities. Okay. Um, we talked or ch chatted just a little bit. You mentioned the word, the trust that the lawyer is uh, given. Can you give folks some examples of this? Not only, obviously, vis-a-vis -vis clients, some obviously trust issues relating to clients, but also the, the court system and as um, officers of the court. What is it that when you're looking at these um, fitness issues, moral fitness issues, what is the primary concern and what are you trying to guard against with lawyers when they, they get into these certain roles? And I don't know that folks always understand exactly that high role that the lawyer actually plays in the system. Well, we, we call ourselves a profession, and what that really means is that we're supposed to put the interests of our clients ahead of our own personal interests. Okay. And so a lot of the problems that we see um, with people filing grievances against lawyers come from uh, lawyers forgetting that and putting their own interests maybe ahead of their clients' interests. So um, we call the rules of professional conduct uh, the Ten Commandments for lawyers. I mean, there, there are way more than ten of them, but, but they are very similar to the, to the Ten Commandments in that um, lawyers can't lie in their professional capacity. They're not supposed to steal other people's money. They're not supposed to cheat. They're supposed to play by this set of rules that really does require um, allegiance to sort of a higher standard than um, just you know, your regular business person would even conduct themselves by. I think it's okay um, in, in other kinds of business for people to be out to make money as their primary goal. For lawyers, that's not supposed to be the primary goal. We really are supposed to look out for the interests of their clients, um, counsel clients, and put their interests ahead of our own. So the duties that we've got relate to that pretty much. There's uh, an obligation first and foremost to the system of justice. The system of justice in the United States is held up worldwide as being um, the best system of justice that people can come up with. And it's not without its problems. I mean, it certainly has its, its flaws, but the reason that it works in large part is because of these duties that lawyers have to it. Mm -hmm. um, and what that means is lawyers can't lie even when it might be in their client's interest. I was just going to say, yeah. it sounds like, um, you know, uh, this is not a scenario where you've got the lawyer just in the interest of advocating for their client, says whatever needs to be said exactly. in a courtroom. They have, they have an obligation both to adhere to the client's goals, but then also to make sure from the court standpoint that they're being straight and honest with the court as well. And that's a little exactly different right. Deal. It, it is a little bit different, and the, the reason that the system is as good as it is, is because it relies on um, a fact finder, a judge, getting information from as many places as possible, sifting through it, and deciding what's the truth. And it wouldn't work if lawyers um, lied. So, and, and a lawyer can't help a client lie either. So that's, that is one of our rules. 
Um, so there are those duties to the system of justice to ensure that the system stays clean and honest. Um, there are duties to the public. We've got duties to make sure that the public understands the law mm -hmm. um, because law doesn't work unless people agree to be bound by it. And it's amazing to me how in this country we do have respect for the law. And, and you know, it sort of keeps from happening what's happening around the world when people try to have an orderly transition of leadership mm -hmm. and um, the public doesn't buy into that, chaos ensues. So it's important for lawyers to be the role models for showing how to comply with the rule of law, how to respect the rule of law, and um, even where that means that you don't get every advantage that you might be able to take for a client or for a case, mm -hmm. it's important that lawyers play by the rules. All right. Yeah. Um, with regard to disciplinary actions, um, we'll need to discuss those disciplinary actions in just a few moments, but I'd like to, when we come back, talk about what happens when lawyers don't adhere to these duties <laughs> that you've just mentioned and uh, when we have problems and where lawyers aren't necessarily as straightforward and honest as we would hope they would be. Um, stay tuned. We'll be back in just a few minutes with Leia's Code to the Honest. Desde el momento en que ellos llegan a nuestras vidas, dan su primer paso. Aprenden a andar en bicicleta. Hasta la preparación de su primer día del quinto grado es un reto para todos los padres criar un hijo saludable. Permítanos guiarle a través de un embarazo seguro y feliz. Aprenda sobre salud, nutrición e información educativa relacionada con el desarrollo de su hijo. Padres e hijos Atlanta, una publicación del mundo hispánico. Recoja su copia gratis hoy. ¿Cuál es su tesoro más preciado? Welcome back to Leia's Care to be Honest. Um, we have with us today Paula Frederick, who is the General Counsel of the State Bar of Georgia. And before the break, we were talking a little bit about um, the grievance process and what to do in the event that the lawyers don't uphold these rules and these um, obligations uh, that we were talking about before the break. Can you tell us a little bit about what it is that um, you see at the bar as far as problems with lawyers or folks that maybe would like to pretend that they're lawyers, and then what is the process for uh, grievances being filed and how are they disciplined, if at all? Sure. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about notarios because particularly with the Spanish-speaking community, we do see um, misunderstandings about the role of a notario and exactly what it is that they can do and what they can't do. And I, uh, from my understanding, some of the confusion results from the fact that in other countries, maybe a notario would be somebody who would be licensed to practice law or entitled to give legal advice. And when you say notario, um, do you mean, in, in the United States, I would have expected that it means a notary public. Is that what you're talking uh, about? Or? Roughly, yes. I okay. think what, what we would be talking about in Georgia, at least, would be somebody who holds a notary public license, which in this state means that they can um, certify for others that a particular person appeared before them and signed documents and took an oath. But in, in Georgia and in the United States of America, um, a notario is not entitled to be a lawyer, to give legal advice, to represent people before a court, or any other tribunal. And um, we do get complaints sometimes at the bar from people who have given a notario money to help them with a legal matter, thinking that in Georgia, the way that it is in their home country, this person's entitled to appear before a court. Uh, but judges in Georgia will not allow a notario to appear in a representative capacity. They can't practice law here. Um, so we, we have an unlicensed practice of law department that investigates claims that a notario has taken money for legal services and sometimes do have, uh, it, it's a crime in Georgia to engage in the unlicensed practice of law. And where we see that happening, we refer it to the local solicitor for, for prosecution as a crime. Okay, so no different than a doctor 
someone who might have gone to med school but maybe didn't pass the appropriate exams and wasn't licensed appropriately or who's been disciplined and disbarred or uh, wouldn't be disbarred for the doctor but who no longer has a license trying to go into a hospital and perform particular services it's no different than that it is no different from that and and that's a good analogy because once someone has been suspended or disbarred from practice even if they were a lawyer mm -hmm. if they continue to try to practice law they they too are engaged in unlicensed practice of law and okay. we would try to have them prosecuted as well. All right. And it sounds like in this particular community you're saying that there's a, a sort of a cottage industry that's come up where they're representing perhaps that you know are, or they're taking advantage of the fact that folks may not understand the difference between a simply a notary public and, and an, an attorney. I think okay. there's a little bit of both okay. um, and, and we've seen both. We've seen uh, people who are deliberately misleading the public, mm -hmm. making people think that they can handle, for instance, an immigration matter on behalf of, of a member of the public when they aren't entitled to do that. They collect the money. They may even try to help the person um, represent themselves, but um, they're not entitled to give and not qualified to give legal advice uh, in Georgia. So, you know, I would just caution folks to know who you're dealing with. If you have any questions about whether a particular individual is licensed to practice law in the state, you can call the State Bar of Georgia or go to our website, which is gabar.org. We have a member directory there, and every single person who's licensed by the State Bar of Georgia is on that website. Well, and in addition to that, I think that brings us into sort of the next issue is, is on the website will also demonstrate whether or not that person is in, quote, good standing. That's right. So let's talk about the good standing and, and how someone may not be in good standing. Exactly. Um, what else are you seeing in addition to this sort of the unauthorized practice of law? Let's say we're talking about folks who are actually authorized to practice law, but they are doing things that are in violation of the various bar rules and so forth. What is the process and how does that grievance process work? All right. Well, you had started asking me what the common problems were. The one that I will mention um, is communication or lack of communication unfortunately I think there's a stereotype about lawyers you know they don't return phone calls <laughs> and that is the number one complaint that people make to my office I can't find out what's going on with my case mm -hmm. um, my lawyer hasn't returned my phone calls I don't know when my court date is um, so sometimes that can be an ethics problem and sometimes it just isn't a lot of people uh, nowadays have really severe expectations about how quickly a lawyer is going to call them back or return an email or something like that. But if you, if you are having trouble getting in touch with your lawyer, you can call the bar and our consumer assistance program can help you get in touch with the lawyer. And you can find the contact information on the website. Um, if our consumer assistance program can't help a client work out whatever the problem is that they're having with a lawyer, then they will refer the case to my office, the Office of the General Counsel, okay. and we'll send you a grievance form. Now, our rules, we've got Supreme Court rules about how we investigate uh, grievances against lawyers. Okay. And they require that the grievance be sent to us in writing. Mm -hmm. um, we've got a Spanish language grievance form too that, mm -hmm. that you could use. Um, you have to write out what the problem is that you're having with a lawyer and send it to us. We do an investigation. We ask the lawyer to respond to whatever it is that's, in, um, that's claimed on the grievance form. And then we decide at the end of our investigation whether it looks like the lawyer has done something unethical. Okay. If so, we send the case on to the disciplinary board. The bar has a disciplinary board that's appointed by the Supreme Court. It's got um, 15 lawyers and six non-lawyers from around the state on it. Um, they serve as a grand jury, mm -hmm. basically, to review grievances and make a decision about whether we should prosecute the lawyer for engaging in unethical conduct. Okay. Where they find that the lawyer's done something unethical, they send the case back to my office and we prosecute the lawyer by filing a case in the Supreme Court of Georgia, having a hearing on the case, just like any other Regular, civil right. court case. Um, the person who filed the grievance would be a witness in that case and come on in and testify about what had happened. Um, and if it's found that the lawyer's done something unethical, he or she can be reprimanded or suspended mm -hmm. or disbarred from practice, as, I'm, as I mentioned before, depending on what it is and how serious it is, um, how much harm there was to the client, for instance. There are mm -hmm. all kinds of decisions that go into um, what the level of discipline ought to be in a particular case. Well, let's talk a little bit about the different types of um, 
harm that can be inflicted and the different types of problems that the lawyers that you see the lawyers uh, engage in. Can you tell me a little bit of sort of what would be, I don't know about top 10, but maybe top two or three problems that you see with lawyers that are, in the, in the bar's view, significant ethical violations um, and that might actually warrant the a full disbarment, and then we can maybe go down from there. Yeah, I'll just give you two. Um, one is probably obvious if you think about it. If a lawyer is convicted of a felony, mm -hmm. he or she is likely to be disbarred. Okay. I, there are very few instances where a lawyer is, who is convicted of a felony doesn't lose his or her license. Um, obviously, is that irrespective of whether or not there's been an actual grievance or any kind of a complaint. Yeah, that's just sort of categorically. Right. We've got a special process for those kinds of cases. Okay. So. Um, you know, every now and then, unfortunately, you'll read about a lawyer who's convicted of murder or um, theft or something like that. And if it is a felony, we've got this summary process to try to remove the lawyer from practice very quickly. Mm -hmm. Other than that, the, the biggest, the most serious problem that we see is um, theft. Okay. Lawyers hold other people's money. Um, we've got particular rules that deal with that that require that they hold it in a separate bank account, an escrow account. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, um, occasionally, lawyers will steal money out of the escrow account. It, if a lawyer does steal money out of an escrow account, pretty much he or she is going to be disbarred. Mm -hmm. um, so those are probably the two most serious. After that, you get into issues like communication, where um, maybe the first time a lawyer has a communication problem, um, there would not be serious discipline, but if it amounts to abandoning a case or right. abandoning a file, then there is going to be discipline that ultimately would lead to disbarment. The, the other thing that we see quite a bit of is problems that are the lawyer's own personal or emotional problems that end up trickling over into his or her professional life. So that if a lawyer is suffering from alcoholism or drug addiction or just depression um, and doesn't get it treated, that ultimately can affect the ability to practice law right. and lead to something like abandonment. Or obviously a drug abuse kind of a problem might lead somebody to steal money to mm -hmm. support the drug habit. Right. So um, those kinds of problems become serious problems that, that cause whatever the, the failure is um, to abide by the rules of professional conduct. All right. Um, we're it seems to me that there might also be an area in which, although maybe not an ethical violation, would still be a problem area between lawyers and clients, and that would be fees. Um, it seems as if you know folks not always understand, and maybe lawyers aren't being very clear about what a fee may be. Sometimes it's hard to know at the beginning of a case what it's going to cost at the end. Um, does the bar have a mechanism, you know, recognizing that, you know, there may be just a simply legitimate dispute as opposed to a lawyer doing something mm -hmm. wrong, is there a mechanism that they have that helps to um, alleviate that issue so that um, those kinds of things are dealt with? Yeah, we have a fee arbitration division at the State Bar of Georgia mm -hmm. that arbitrates fee disputes between lawyers and clients. It is isn't unethical to have a disagreement about a fee. Um, so if, if you are having that kind of problem with a lawyer, you can file a petition for fee arbitration. Okay. They, there's an arbitration panel that has two lawyers and a non-lawyer, and they hear those disputes and decide whether the client's owed a refund, whether the client owes more money. Um, but you're right, those aren't ethics problems all the time. I think one of the things, too, about fees, we, uh, we do require that fee agreements on contingency fee cases be in writing. Okay. But those are the only ones that the rules require to be in writing. I just encourage folks who are hiring a lawyer to ask for a written fee agreement. Mm -hmm. they, they aren't required, but I think they do help reduce confusion about what it is that you're going to owe at the end of the case. Mm -hmm. So if you're out there um, interviewing a lawyer, thinking about hiring a lawyer for something, and the lawyer isn't automatically providing you with a written agreement, there's no harm in asking for one. All right. Um, we just have a few minutes left. Is there anything that if you were giving advice to someone who may need lawyers, what would you tell them would, would probably be their best uh, action to take in doing that to hopefully they avoid these issues that, that, that have come up? There are lots of things that people can do on their own. Um, they can do their own research online about a lawyer. You can look online at our website, for instance, and find out whether a lawyer has a history of discipline, whether they've been disciplined in the past. Find out how long they've been licensed, 
You can find out things like where they went to law school. Um, I am always surprised that people hesitate to ask questions. Mm -hmm. And I think some of it is that lawyers can be intimidating. But if, if you go in to hire a lawyer, you should find somebody who you're comfortable with and who you feel comfortable asking questions because mm -hmm. you need to understand your case. And um, you, know, you shouldn't just sit there and nod your head when the lawyer talks yeah. if you don't really understand what the lawyer's saying. So I just encourage folks to ask a lot of questions, um, get a written fee agreement, and do some research on the lawyer. Get some referrals from friends or family um, if you're looking for uh, a lawyer to hire. All right. Well, unfortunately, I think we're out of time, but thank you very much for joining us. I think this has been very helpful, and hopefully we'll give folks a good understanding of, of the legal process and a little bit behind the scenes on, on how it is that lawyers are regulated. You can find this and much more on our website at laiscotadianis.com. Be sure to like us on Facebook, and as always, previews for this show and all of our shows are on YouTube. Thank you very much. Leyes Cotidianas. Les llega a ustedes gracias al generoso apoyo financiero de la Fundación de Justicia Civil del Estado de Georgia. Mundo Hispánico, el vocero de la comunidad hispana desde 1979. La estación transmisora WPBA no tiene licencia para practicar leyes en el estado de Georgia. WPBA y los patrocinadores de este programa no son responsables por las opiniones expresadas ni la información proporcionada por los abogados en este programa. Este programa se ofrece como un servicio público. El objetivo de este programa es de informar y educar y no de proveer consejo legal. Si usted necesita consejo legal, favor de consultar a un abogado.